So I'm just going to introduce to you uh, Graham Christian, which is basically the reason I can go to customers and tell them, yes, we have security of it. Uh, when I, in his day to day, when he's not working on security updates, he's uh, working as a site reliability engineer at Tumblr. Give that for Graham. Uh, so, I'd, I guess I'd like to start with some history on the efforts of keeping NixOS secure over, the, at least since when I started. Um, and I'd just like to note that it's actually, Franz makes many, many security pull requests and way more than I do these days. Um, so I'd like to thank him first. Um, oops. In early 2016, uh, I had just joined the project like 45 days earlier, <laughs> and I noticed that Franz had put in dozens of patches over like an hour, and I was just blown away and didn't know what he was doing or where he was getting them from, but I wanted to help and I, I really wanted to get involved. Um, so I asked him what he was doing, he said, you know, we've, uh, there's this list of vulnerabilities on lwin.net, and I'm just going through basically everything from I don't know, maybe the last year. <laughs> we went through a lot of pages. Uh, and um, what, what they do is, or what they did, is they would track every vulnerability that came out that was announced by a bunch of diff different Linux distributions um, and then aggregate them together. So if there was an issue in, uh, let's pick on bind some more. If there was an issue in bind, <laughs> They would link to the issue for Fedora, for, for Red Hat, for Ubuntu, for Debian, um, for Gentoo, and then you could go to any one of those and find a, a relevant patch, and it made it way easy to go and uh, fix the issue in as little time as possible, um, and made it easy to actually find the list of problems. Um, Shortly after that, uh, this idea of going to LWN and looking at their list and then patching six months of security vulnerabilities became officially part of the release process. <laughs> um, uh, that, it's tough. It's tough to do that. Um, which uh, I think was really nicely demonstrated by the very first vulnerability roundup that I opened, uh, I believe, in September of 2016. And it had 850 issues for us to look at. Um, and it was broken down into what project it was related to, and a link and a small uh, description of the issue. Um, and it was checkboxes on a GitHub issue, which was massive. Uh, and we found a lot of issues using GitHub issues as a database. Uh, it doesn't work very well. Um, if two people tick two boxes at the same time, one wins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or neither wins, uh, as happens sometimes. Um, and this is just a, a small list of the people who are actually authoring pull requests, just the easy ones I could find on the issue. Um, thank you to all of these people. Um, and people reviewing the pull request. This op I mean, 850 issues opened a whole lot of pull requests um, and certainly contributed to one of those ticks you all found. Um, and then the mergers, of course. Uh, huge amount of effort went into this. It took six days to actually go through that whole list. Um, I, I was impressed it took six days, but at the same time, I sort of felt like it took a month. Um, it was maybe the longest, most exhausting project I've ever worked on. Um, but uh, we managed to get all 850 of these done um, in time for the 1609 branch release. Yeah. And I think it made 1609, in a lot of ways, um, one of the best, or started the process that made 1609 one of the best, most secure releases we've had. Um, so after 1609, uh, it started this regular weekly community effort of reviewing the uh, issues on LWN from the previous week. So we were quite up to date and regular and prompt and fast at getting all of these issues patched. Um, better than many distributions. Uh, a, a fun thing about this process is that pretty frequently some distribution realized they hadn't patched something from 2014 or 2010 or 2003 
Um, and uh, we, those would come up in LWN again, and it would, it would be like patched by Fedora in 2003, patched by Debian in 2004, and then uh, Gen2 did this a lot, patched by Gen2 2016. Um, but we were vulnerable like the whole time, and so I was really grateful for, um, for all that, that help and data that they provided. Um, and I really want to focus that this was a community effort. It wasn't just a single person doing all this work. And that was incredibly helpful. Uh, shortly after, uh, we officially created this NIC security announce mailing list, um, something to help bring us to becoming more mature with distribution. Um, that's a pr uh, something that's close to my heart and something that's important to me. Uh, you could subscribe to this and receive advisories. Um, unfortunately, this is somewhat fallen by the wayside, uh, but I'm, I'm hoping we'll bring it back shortly. Uh, pretty soon after that, we formally created a NixOS security team. Uh, this team has handled four or five instances at this, at this point, um, specifically around uh, we, we received some embargoed security issues that we can um, prepare to patch ahead of time. Uh, most of those get, end up getting leaked, but not by us. Uh, <laughs> Um, and then uh, some critical issues that we've discovered in uh, how Nix OS modules worked, a few authentication issues, um, and then actually some, some issues that we've found in Nix itself, which is a lot of fun to find. Um, and so we had set up this wonderful weekly process, we had developed this community effort, and then what felt like no time at all, um, oh, sorry, March 1st came, and we had done 24 of these, tri uh, triaged 1,500 <coughs> reports, which is, blew me away when I saw that, um, and, and LWN shut down uh, their vulnerability service, which broke all of the tooling that we had built um, and pretty much uh, ruined um, our, our process. Uh, it, was, it was a bit devastating, actually. Um, I remember running the script to build the report, and it showed three. And I thought, oh boy, that's, it shouldn't be three. It's never three. <laughs> um, there were some attempts after uh, LWN shut down to create uh, alternative tooling, some ideas around looking at every CVE that is issued, or uh, creating issues out of every mailing to the OSS security mailing list. Um, unfortunately, those haven't really panned out quite yet, um, but I'm optimistic for the future. Um, which I, I'm looking to discuss. Um, and to start out, uh, I think Peter and I agree, I, I really want uh, NixOS to be commercially viable, and I want it to be an option that CTOs can look at and say, yes, that's a good idea. Um, and I think it offers real value that we need to be selling much better. I, I don't think the value proposition of Nix is that it's purely functional. I think the value proposition of Nix is that you can deploy something and undo it and, and be back to where you started. You can accidentally install some package and it, it, as long as you don't update your <coughs> system to use it, it it's just um, in your store. It doesn't t impact anything. Um, I once interviewed with a company that makes automatic cranes for um, ports, and they run ports all over the world, and it costs a million dollars in lost revenue every single time they deploy, per port. They have to shut down everything, all the ships have to wait, all the trucks have to wait, nothing is happening, um, and if something goes wrong, it can quickly, quickly add up, because this is, this is an hour, a million dollars in an hour. Um, they, we, we discussed briefly using Nix, um, but again, it's not quite ready. But I think it, it deserves a space, um, deserves a mention in this space because of how safe it is. Um, and I think uh, among the issues that Peter recommended um, or pointed out are demonstrating that we do care about security. We do care about keeping our users safe. And he literally said this in his, in his talk, is, is you look at a small distribution and you think, you know, is, some, is somebody going to leave and is their effort just going to go away? If Franz left today, would our security patches evaporate? Um, many of them, probably. And that's, that's an issue. 
Um, as I noted, one option that we looked at was just looking at every CVE that comes out. Um, I don't know if you've looked at a recent C uh, security advisory for Chrome lately, but it's 100 CVEs per release. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to track at that level because um, the, the, the patches don't come per CVE. The patches come per overarching issue. And the overarching issue for Chrome might involve five CVEs. Another issue with tracking CVEs themselves is they, um, they're issued by numbering authorities. So they start CVE-year and then a long number. Um, that number goes up into the millions, I believe, uh, every year. But in reality, they're broken up into like a few thousand increments it given to authorities who can issue C C um, uh, CVEs themselves. Uh, so, and, and some of those might be embargoed, some of them might be reserved and then never used. So you can't actually look at the space and say, yes, I have a contiguous series of CVEs from one to a million, I've got all of the CVEs, because there's gonna be gaps. It's very difficult to stay on top of this. Um, a better option is something that we tried, but not very successfully, which was watching OSS security. Um, and what, what we looked into doing was automatically creating GitHub issues per thread on OSS security, which it took the hell of an email client and moved it to GitHub. Um, and it was really, really not any fun. Um, what most distributions do is, yes, they follow OSS security, and yes, they follow full disclosure. But the, the process of going from an email to the list to an issue in their tracker is manual. And a process of review and triage and um, first, I mean, seeing if they're even impacted by it or if they even package the, the, the software it, it touches. Um, this is where a community effort comes in. We're gonna need, we would need help with this. Um, all of this is leading up to a goal. Again, Peter set this goal a few years ago um, of joining the famous Linux distro list. This list handles embargoed security patches. It has about 10 to 15 Linux distributions on it, and we would like to be one of them. Um, you can imagine that's going to be difficult, but I think we can make it. And the reason um, we want to be on this is so that we can receive the patches ahead of time, get them prepared, and then release them as soon as it goes live, and um, uh, keep, keep our users safe. Um, one reason I find this such an important goal is I think it sends an extremely clear message that we care and that we're dedicated to the issue. They, uh, getting on this list is difficult. They have a lot of requirements. They want to know you are serious. They want to know that you are capable of handling encrypted, uh, encrypted mail. They want to know that you're capable of keeping secrets. They want to know that if they let you in, you're not going to spoil it. Um, I'm going to go through some of the requirements they have. One is that we're Unix-like, and while we don't follow the hierarchy standard, we are Unix-like, um, and we are open source. We've got this one. Um, we are not an internal product. Uh, if we were a Linux distribution used only exclusively inside of a greater organization, we would not be um, allowed in. We are not a downstream rebuild. For example, uh, when uh, Red Hat is a member of this list, however, downstream rebuilds like Scientific Linux are not on this list. Because as soon as Red Hat issues the patches to their distribution, it's very simple for Scientific to then take those patches and um, release to their users. Since we are our own thing, we are allowed in. This one's tricky. We need somebody who's already on the list to trust us enough to recommend we join the list, which means if we screw it up, we look poorly, <coughs> reflect poorly on the person who recommends us. Um, <laughs> we need to do it for a year, and I think that's reasonable. We, we, have to, uh, we can't just decide one day to, to be serious about security and then ask for membership and get in. And we need to be able to patch and release the, patch, the, issue, uh, the fixes within 10 days. Um, and back when we were doing the weekly roundups, we were. We were well within that mark. Um, I think 
the issue is consistency in the community effort. Uh, Franz does great work. Uh, everybody else who does security patching does great work. Um, but we need to do it a lot, and we need to do it continuously. And we need to be really thorough and build a process and tooling around this to ensure that we are doing a good job. And I'm going to read it. We can't choose to be consistent here today. We must choose to be consistent every day when we wake up. This is, this is a commitment that we have to make. And I can't make it for the community. Neither can friends. Um, back when I started the roundups, I created an issue that would go off at, or a reminder at 6.45 every morning. Um, and every, or every Wednesday morning, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and that, that's how I achieved um, consistently making this list every, every single week. And I, I don't, I, I mean, this works for me, I, but I, I think this is a personal thing that people need to commit to, is doing some effort on a weekly basis to keep MixOS secure. And then as an organization, we can organize around that and make the tooling and process to make that easy. Um, as I noted earlier, most distros triage issues um, by hand. Uh, I think this makes sense. I think uh, attempts at parsing CVEs uh, mechanically or doing natural, natural language parsing on emails it mechanically is uh, interesting, um, and I would be interested in seeing what comes out of that. But ultimately, I think in order to be truly consistent, we have to have the human element in there reading and, and inspecting whether or not we are um, impacted. We need tools and processes. This is uh, what an issue tracker, something specific to security issues, something that lets us record the state of whether or not they impact various different channels or releases. Uh, we need to be able to document that 1609 is continuously becoming more and more out of date, that 1703 is becoming more and more out of date, because those are important prods to get people off of those distributions. We can tell them we don't maintain it, but we can't, but we can't tell them 1603 is vulnerable to a thousand issues, because um, we don't track that right now. And we must use these tools to share the load. Um, I mentioned that earlier as a question about the release process. Um, we have to build these tools in a way that is very easy for anybody to just come in and join and participate in the process. Um, one thing I liked about the checklists that we used before um, was that even if somebody didn't have uh, access to tick the boxes, they could send a pull request and it was easy for somebody who did to go up and tick the box. Um, for as it stands now, if um, People can help by simply monitoring mailing lists that they care about. Or if they see on popular news websites an issue, they can go and check NixOS to see if it's secure. <coughs> or they can uh, watch the 70 commits a day to master and see the security relevant ones and back forth them to stable. Um, and if you don't know how to patch or are afraid to patch something, there's some dependencies that uh, spook me. I don't know what they do, but I know that they rebuild a lot of things. Um, I'll open an issue. And <laughs> the, the, the most important thing is to try. <laughs> that, this, this, is how, this is how the first one came about. This is how the Vulnerability Roundup 1 came about. It wasn't anything fancy. I wrote a bunch of bash scripts with curl and sed and awk and, and whatever, and somehow that created a coherent piece of markdown that I could make into a GitHub issue. <laughs> it was ugly. It was nasty. It got rewritten for Roundup number 2. <laughs> um, but I tried, and it worked really well for six months. Um, and I would encourage anybody to try. Uh, and I, if anybody's interested in trying, I would like to help you try. Um, some additional issues that we would need to address to join the distro list is that we have to have quite a bit of private infrastructure. And I mean really private. We have to have a bug tracker that isn't GitHub. We can't put embargoed security issues on GitHub, uh, even a private one. Um, we have, I believe we have support for private um, issues or private builds on Hydra, but they still push to the binary cache. We can't push to the binary cache. We have to keep these extremely limited um, to, to how uh, somebody could find the issue. And private code branches as well. Um, and again, not on GitHub. All three of these need to be on self-hosted 
systems that we completely control. Um, this isn't specifically spelled out in the rules of the OSS or uh, the private distro list, but I'm pretty sure only because nobody's had the, the gall to actually ask. Um, one thing that I think is popular to talk about but isn't such an issue is how quickly it takes or how much time it takes to release uh, patches. Um, the goal of the distro list is to get patches out to uh, maintainers seven to ten days before they go public. And if you can release your patches uh, as a distribution within seven to days, ten days of them being be becoming public, you're well within your, um, what they like to see. Uh, if it takes longer than ten days, there's no sense in you being in the embargoed list because you simply can't um, benefit from the process. Um, a, uh, a small, the small channel that has a much reduced uh, package set, we can release a mass rebuild from that in um, three hours. Um, the large, the full package set can be released in 24, maybe faster. Um, Hydra has a existing support to auto scale up based on how many jobs are in the queue. And it is also possible to um, scale up unautomatically uh, if we have a big issue that we want to push out quickly. Um, that said, I do see our ability to merge and release patches quickly as a security relevant issue for our posture. Um, I think it is important that we be able to, to merge and release as quickly as possible for when there is a true emergency. Um, one of the problems that blocks this is if there's a mass rebuild that is submitted and it breaks a lot of packages. So we do need a way to be able to pre-flight mass rebuild and see what the impact is. Um, I think there's a lot we could learn from the open build system. Um, and I, I would like, I'd like somebody uh, to study with that and try and figure out how we can bring that to NixOS. Um, <laughs> the uh, zero hydro failures is a project that happens before every release. Um, and it is essentially what vulnerability roundup number one was. It was looking at everything that's, that started to fail since the previous release and um, said, all right, here's a massive list of, of things. Let's go fix as many as possible and then um, mark the rest as broken. Um, and this is fine, uh, but it's a lot of work and it's all at once and it's right when we're trying to do a lot of other things um, <laughs> and trying to organize this release. And I think it would be better if we just didn't put ourselves in that situation where we needed this massive catch-up issue. Um, something like a regular weekly zero hydro failure pro uh, issue that we all uh, rallied around and worked on. Um, uh, a sort of orthogonal project would be better PR testing and being able to more automatically uh, review pull requests so that when somebody who has merge rights goes to look at a pull request, they don't have to spend their time um, debugging tri uh, trivial issues, like this just doesn't avail. Uh, a, a maintainer shouldn't be the one to point out that um, a pull request doesn't evaluate. Um, uh, and it, additionally, it would be nice to have some automatic pull request testing. Um, as, a, as a benefit, if we, if we keep on top of, our, of our, uh, our builds and keep everything green, it's much easier to merge code because you know exactly this pull request broke it or um, versus the situation now, which is if there's a mass rebuild and a bunch of stuff shows up broken at the end, you don't know if it's already broken. You don't know what the impact is. It's very hard to quantify this. And that is actually part of what made my first attempt at this, um, I think, fail. Uh, I set up a Hydra uh, using an astounding amount of hardware donated by packet.net. I highly recommend you go look, look at them. I don't work for them, but they're really great people. Um, and the Hydra would automatically create uh, job sets for every single pull request that came in. Um, the, <laughs> the, the number of derivations that get built in every single pull request is a, a lot, um, 40,000. Uh, and it turns out the 70 pull requests, is that the number, 70? Um, is, is a lot. Uh, we had a lot of cores working on this. Um, and fundamentally, I think there's some uh, scaling issues 
with hyd how Hydra is architected that makes this difficult. Um, but really what, what made this difficult is it, was, it would build everything and it was still so hard to tell if it, was a, if it was a good change or a bad change. If the 500 failures are new or if the 500 failures are, are um, or ev is even an improvement. Um, yeah, this was, this was challenging. Um, a more recent attempt, uh, I got frustrated at something a few days ago and uh, set up Gram C of Borg um, to assimilate all of the PRs. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it does two things right now. One is that as soon as a pull request is in, usually, sometimes it's broken, um, it does an estimate of how many uh, jobs we'll have to rebuild on Hydra, and it automatically labels them, and it automatically, thanks to uh, Daniel Peebles, um, labels them based on how many rebuilds will impact Linux and how many rebuilds will impact Darwin. Um, this has been pretty nice because I've discovered things that are kind of big rebuilds uh, that I didn't know were big rebuilds. Um, the second thing it does is uh, from a very small list at the moment, it, it can accept commands to build um, specific uh, attributes, spe specific pieces of mixed packages. Um, this avoids the problem of uh, I submitted an update to this package in and in and uh, okay, now I'm going to go build 40,000 things. Um, nothing depends on in and in. We know that because the label says it impacts 1 to 10 things. Um, why try building 40,000 when we can just build in and in? Um, so this uh, by accepts a list of attributes that you'd like to test. It then starts a job um, and builds it right now just on Linux. Um, uh, soon it will also be building PRs on uh, Darwin as well, which I think will be really cool. Um, this is a difficult issue, actually, Darwin, because it can be hard for um, people using NixOS to know how their pull request impacts Darwin. Um, uh, Darwin doesn't have curl in the standard environment. Um, Darwin can't run certain software. It's, you, you might add a dependency to uh, a package and then it, it ruins the standard environment for Darwin and you wouldn't even know it until one of the Darwin contributors finds out and puts in a patch. Um, surprisingly, uh, I, I didn't expect this, but I think it's really good news and pretty neat, um, is we've been invited to become a CNA, which is who, an organization that issues CVE IDs. Um, we were asked to do this by a member of the Red Hat security team, who is also part of the organization of this, the Embargo Distro List. Um, the CNAs, I, I believe, would help us develop a relationship with the security community as a whole and help us become closer and more involved and ultimately brings us closer to becoming part of the distro list. Um, this is my contact information if you'd like to chat with me. Um, I'm pretty sure I've talked with probably most of you at some point in time. Um, I'm not very good with faces or names. <laughs> so I apologize, uh, but feel free to reach out. Um, yeah, thank you. All right, we have 10 minutes. Behind you. Hi. Um, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, Currently, I think we have a pretty liberal uh, policy in, in accepting package, new, new packages, and I guess it's not necessarily always guaranteed uh, that they will be maintained for security updates. Uh, do you have any, any uh, opinion on that, or like uh, whether we should be more or less liberal in accepting packages? I think that with the advent of overlays, that changes the issue. Um, I think in a lot of ways it's difficult for us to be gatekeepers on what becomes part of mixed packages. I think um, it is should be a requirement that if somebody does contribute a package, they are listed as the maintainer of the package. Um, that said, a lot of the maintainer workflows that exist are uh, pre-GitHub. Um, and as 
the graph showed earlier, we receive tons of drive-by contributions. What does it look, look, look like to be a maintainer when a good chunk of, of contributions are drive-by? They're not people interested in, in being maintainers. I think we should accept updates from them, um, but I wouldn't, uh, I'd be hesitant to accept new packages if they're not willing to maintain them. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, orthogonal to the issue of people asking for new packages. Is if you're asking for a new package, then nobody who's main interested in maintaining it has packaged it. Actually, I have a question. Um, <laughs> could we maybe use the OpenSUSE connection that now we know we have? I, I'm, uh, during that talk, I was trying to figure out how to make this run an open, open build system. <laughs> <laughs> Um, have you spoken to the to the Linux Weekly News people who quit maintaining these things? Maybe they have some tooling around how they constructed such an amazing list, and uh, or maybe they there was some internal politics, and maybe someone still wants to do it. Or like like, have you spoken to the people behind it? I have. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when I first did the first fifteen, or maybe it was even up to twenty, I hadn't actually asked permission to use the data, um, and it wasn't specifically licensed, so I, I uh, got up my courage, sent them an email and said, hey, could I use this data? I've been using it for a long time. Sorry about not asking, but can I use this data? And they said, yes, absolutely. And then four weeks later, they shut it down. Um, <laughs> uh, I asked them further about why they shut it down. Just like the distros, the process is manual. They have as much tooling as you and I have in our email clients to do it, um, and uh, I guess like a search tool, um, unfortunately. Uh, and that's why they shut it down, is it didn't get a lot of interest, except Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, it was taking too much employee time. Um, can, uh, can you tell a bit more about uh, Gram CEO Bog? Uh, it's uh, current features, so it's uh, roadmap, it's uh, scope. Yeah, um, its current feature set is exactly these two things. Is it free flights, the, the build to see how many rebuild, um, and then it'll build specific things you ask for. Um, in terms of roadmap, uh, I wrote this in PHP, um, so I'd like it to not be written in PHP. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's probably number one. Uh, number two is adding support to fan out to Darwin. That's going to be probably a 20 minute project this afternoon. Um, uh, a, I think an important thing I would I'd really like to do is be able to sample a mass rebuild. Um, uh, oh, the most important thing is that this runs on people's laptops. <laughs> uh, volunteers can install the, the daemon, will be able to install the daemon and um, pick up approved job sets and build them locally. Uh, that's why it doesn't build everything that's changed. It's because it needs to be cognizant of, of being a visitor on somebody's laptop. Um, and that's why it only has a specific list of people who can trigger it. Um, I'd like to open that up quite wide. Um, and I think the Nix sandboxing makes that pretty safe to do, um, but just starting slow. Any more questions? All right. If there is no more questions, we can get to the pizzas earlier. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Thank you.